Tonight, the heroes of the Hudson, the captain who steered his crippled jet to a safe landing. He's a pilot's pilot. One crew member gave this passenger the shirt off his back. I don't know how many lives I've got, but I really feel that today's a new beginning. I'm Maggie Rodriguez. Also tonight, how they survived that crash on the water. We'll show you the training that flight crews get, practicing for a worst case scenario. And he's played for five presidents, but he's got goosebumps over his next performance for Barack Obama. This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. Good evening, I'm Maggie Rodriguez. Katie is off. We're learning more tonight about the heroes and survivors of U.S. Airways Flight 1549 as the investigation moves into high gear. That Airbus A320 remains moored at a dock, its left wing sticking out of the frigid Hudson River. And these are the last pictures of 1549, taken by a surveillance camera as the captain considered landing at two area airports but decided his only choice was to set it down in the Hudson. Tomorrow, investigators will raise the plane. They'll also continue searching the river for the two engines, and the National Transportation Safety Board will begin interviewing the pilots. Bob Orr has the latest on the investigation. New images taken just moments before impact show a crippled U.S. Airways Flight 1549 gliding towards the water landing, now hailed as the miracle on the Hudson. A day later, critical evidence remains submerged with the swamp jetliner, tethered to an icy pier in lower Manhattan. And investigators have problems that hope today to interview the pilots who've been universally praised for saving the 155 people on board. Now the interviews will happen tomorrow. Crash experts still have not recovered the black boxes, and the engines are not with the wreckage. Investigators need to find the engines in order to confirm the plane was brought down by a flock of Canada geese. We've got the New York Police Department working with the Corps of Engineers and using side scan sonar and they're out there now trying to uh, locate the engines. Whatever happened, it's increasingly clear the pilots facing a double engine failure at a critical moment in flight made all the right moves, all the key split second decisions to ward off catastrophe. The fully loaded Airbus 320 was just three minutes out of LaGuardia, climbing to the north when the pilots radioed that hit a flock of birds. First one engine died and then the other. With the jetliner now essentially a glider, the pilots turned to the south and headed for the only clearing they saw. The plane began dropping over the Hudson River, losing altitude, bleeding off speed, as it crossed 900 feet above the George Washington Bridge. Just 300 feet above the water, and still traveling 176 miles an hour, the pilots raised the nose, and the passengers braced for impact. Pilots made sure they splashed tail first to prevent the wings or the engines from tripping and cartwheeling the plane. Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger was at the controls, and while federal investigators have kept him from speaking to the media, his wife today offered this humble assessment. He's a pilot's pilot, and uh, he loves the art of the airplane. Captain John Cox agrees. Cox, who spent years as a colleague flying for U.S. Airways, praised Sullenberger's actions. He, he personifies everything you could ask out of a professional airman. He's very cool under pressure. He's highly trained. He takes it very seriously. Water landings are rare and dangerous. There have only been a few commercial flights that have ever been deliberately ditched. In 1996, a hijacked Ethiopian Airlines jet tried to land on the Indian Ocean. Two-thirds of the people on board were killed. Yesterday, this is what the pilots and passengers of Flight 1549 were staring at as they crossed the George Washington Bridge. Cox says Sullenberger had one shot, one chance to get it right. It took a consummate professional like Sully Sullenberger to do this well, and he and his crew did. Now, investigators hope sometime tomorrow to raise the wreckage from the huts and put it on a barge. And if that happens, that will give investigators their first real chance to try to figure out exactly what went wrong. Maggie? And, Bob, we know they'll probably find the birds were the culprits. We've always known this is a threat to airplanes, but in light of this accident, what can airports do differently? Well, in the future, they're using radar technology to map the migratory patterns of birds so they can locate runways away from nesting areas. The problem is a lot of airports right now are next to dumps, next to waterways, next to nesting areas, and, and that creates a problem because birds are in conflict with the planes. And while they use things like cannons and sound effects and dogs to scare them away, they will always be somewhat of a threat. Maggie? 
All right, Bob Warren, New York. Thank you, Bob. Among the survivors of Flight 1549, it's nearly universal. They're amazed that everyone on the plane made it out alive. And some of the stories they have to tell are nothing short of amazing as well. Here's Kelly Wallace. 55-year-old Barry Leonard, a father of two from Charlotte, is one of the last passengers still in the hospital and was the first one off the plane. So they just said, jump. In the water, freezing, he swam to a lifeboat. One of the pilots, he still doesn't know which, helped him. The pilot gave me the shirt off his back, which is somewhere, this, yeah, somewhere there it is. I mean, this is it here, which is, uh, you know, which is what I wore. <laughs> That led to a case of mistaken identity. People were saying, great job landing the plane, and I was like, I didn't land the plane. <laughs> On the raft and with a cracked sternum, he managed to call his wife, Sherry. Today, they were reunited. The hands. <laughs> Sherry, is that hand not going to come off? It's right. not leaving not his leaving. body. Right. <laughs> Aboard the down jet, business executives, golf buddies, and a mother clutching a nine-month-old in her arms. It was amazing how people moved the women and that, especially that woman with the child, to the front of the, to the front of the wing. Many passengers didn't think they'd make it. One man turned his cell phone on so his body could be found through the phone's GPS. A woman left a message for her husband, tell the kids I love them. Carl Vazarian described the moments before impact. And you normally, you know, you're supposed to put your head down and so forth. We didn't. We all wanted to see reality. It really, most of the people, we were all looking to see uh, how are we going to die? It was Early this morning, survivors reunited with loved ones back home in Charlotte. Brad Wenzel yes. talked of snuggling his two-year-old daughter. Give a nice kiss from Daddy, because I'm alive. Last night in the hospital, two other men reflected on almost losing it all. Barry Leonard learned he and Dave Sanderson lived just a half mile apart. The one, pro the one promise that he and I made to each other was that, you know, we were going to be there for each other. And I know he will, and I know I will. Just two of the lives forever changed by the near tragedy they all survived. Kelly Wallace, CBS News, New York. And they all survived in large part because of the man known as Sully, the most celebrated pilot in America. It's as if he spent his whole life preparing for those few terrifying moments in the cockpit. And those closest to him are not one bit surprised. More now from John Blackstone. Those who know pilot Chesley Sullenberger best say hero is not the way he's likely to describe himself. He's a pilot. He's very controlled and um, very professional. For Sullenberger's wife and daughters at home in California, all the talk about hero is taking some getting used to. The girls went to sleep last night talking. I could hear them in the bedroom saying, is this weird or what? <laughs> but the world now knows him by his nickname, Sully. On Facebook, people around the globe thank him for the amazing landing. They call him a rock star and an angel who saved 155 lives. At 57, Sullenberger has been flying for more than 40 years. Growing up in Denison, Texas, he learned to fly a crop duster, his sister says, when he was just 15. If there's a plane to be flown, he can do it. In 1973, he graduated from the Air Force Academy as best aviator in his class. Back at that time, they spent $1,200,000 to train each Air Force pilot. There's no country on the earth that spends more money and invests more in its pilot training in the United States. In his 29 years as a commercial pilot, safety has been Sullenberger's focus. He's also a risk management consultant and does safety research at the University of California, Berkeley. Even his email address is sully at safetyreliability.com. Thank God. Somebody was at the helm of that ship that knew how to keep it floating. He did his duty. Maybe he did it the best he could, which is fantastic, but it wasn't being heroic. It was doing his job. Sully may not think of himself as a hero, but that won't stop the rest of the world from calling him one. John Blackstone, CBS News, San Francisco.
As you probably know, it was freezing in New York City when the plane crashed, and much of the country saw more of the same today. It got down to 29 degrees below zero this morning in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, breaking a record that was frozen in place for 35 years. The chill extends south and east. The high in Clayton, Maine today was five below zero, and tonight it may hit 40 below. But out west, surprising warmth. It was 82 degrees in Los Angeles. And there's more chilling news about the economy tonight and two of the nation's largest banks. One of them is splitting apart, while the other was given even more taxpayer money today. Here's Anthony Mason. It's back to the bailout trough for Bank of America. The Treasury will invest another $20 billion in the nation's largest bank and guarantee $118 billion in assets. The reason for the rescue this time? A very, very intense time. The bank's shotgun marriage with Merrill Lynch in September was on the rocks. With Merrill bleeding losses, CEO Kenneth Lewis considered abandoning the merger, which could have shaken the financial system. Listening to that on the news this morning, and I went, that's not really very good. The news at Citigroup wasn't good either. After another $8 billion in losses, the bank will split in two. One company for its profitable assets, the other for those in trouble. Banks are under increasing pressure because more and more borrowers are falling behind on credit card and mortgage payments. For example, 850,000 foreclosed properties are now owned by banks, but about 70% have not been put on the market yet. Why are these properties still in the bank's books? Really good question. Rick Sharga um, says it may be just an overwhelming backlog, or there could be another explanation. Perhaps the banks are deferring uh, the write-downs uh, because the, the losses would be so severe when they sell these properties at actual market value that it, in some cases the banks may become insolvent. They'd go under. They'd go under. Meanwhile, 30,000 more job cuts were announced today by Circuit City, the country's second biggest electronics chain, which is closing all 567 stores in the U.S. Maggie. Anthony Mason. Thank you, Anthony. There's no question the economic crisis contributed to President Bush's poor showing in the final CBS News New York Times poll on his job performance. This poll out tonight puts Mr. Bush's approval rating at just 22 percent. That is the lowest for an outgoing president since the question was first asked more than 70 years ago. Meanwhile, 68 percent said they expect Barack Obama to be a good or very good president. Coming up next here on the CBS Evening News, what you should do if your pilot makes a terrifying announcement. Brace for impact. It's a frightening question to ponder. What would you do if you found yourself on a plane forced down in water? Five heroic crew members on U.S. Airways Flight 1549 made sure that 150 passengers learned the answer. As Ben Tracy reports tonight, it's all in their training. At this flight training center near Los Angeles, they simulate for flight crews the very real emergency that took place on the Hudson yesterday. Let's say we're passengers on this plane. Brian Omahan of HRD Aerosystem says a water landing is called a ditching. Planes are made to withstand them, and the crew is trained to keep you alive. What's going to happen? Well, the first thing we're going to do is remain calm, listen to the flight attendant, listen to the instructions. Okay, everyone, we've been informed that there's going to be a water ditching. Don your life vests. Once passengers have their life vests on, they prepare for impact. Bend over, grab your ankles, and I need you to hold tight and listen to my voice. And when the plane hits the water, it's all about getting out quickly. The water came up. I started to get you know, close to my neck underwater, and, you know, I just thought I was going to drown right there. But flight crews are trained to evacuate a full plane in 90 seconds. They're really more than waitresses and waiters in the sky. They've been trained to help people survive, and we need to listen to them. Follow me to the overwing exit. Exit leg, body, leg. Do not inflate your life vest until you're overwing. Leg, body, leg. Come on, everyone, go. Okay, pull down on the red tabs of your life vest to inflate. One. At this point, passengers are likely standing on the wing, just like many on flight 1549, who then climbed on a nearby ferries. As soon as we pulled up alongside, they all started scrambling to the ladder, and we had to kind of tell them to, you know, settle down, you know, be calm. Here we go. Other passengers wound up in the same kind of rafts they use in training.
Now, once your raft is inflated, obviously you just hop on in and try to get as far away from the plane as you can. Now, all of these emergency procedures are in these pamphlets that are in the seat back pocket on every airplane. Of course, Maggie, many of us never read them. But I will now. Ben Tracy in California. Thank you, Ben. When we come back, an exclusive look at the high-tech shield designed to protect the president. It's a technological marvel that looks like a regular piece of glass, but is strong enough to prevent a disaster. Chief investigative correspondent Armand Katayan got an exclusive look at the new shield designed to protect a president. When Barack Obama first stepped out on the stage as president-elect, a new transparent shield made its own debut. CBS News recently got an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at the high-tech suburban New York company, little known to the public, that created the shield. Entrusted with the monumental task of protecting the president, American Defense Systems, Inc., or ADSI. We're here to protect and serve those that defend, serve, and protect us. Obama's shield is starkly different, lighter, thinner, stronger from the one first built to guard President Ronald Reagan. Today, they are multi-layered combinations of space-age material, including glass, ceramic, crystal, and even polymers used to cover a golf ball. And we are on the so-called attack side right now? We're on the attack side. The cameraman's on the safe side. The glass is designed to resist bullets, blasts, and unwanted entry, while providing the clear-eyed access the press and public have come to expect. ADSI allowed two NYPD sharpshooters to put their product to the test. In all, they fired more than 75 rounds of high-caliber ammo into a shield. The glass is hit. Some spray will come off. Uh, we then inspected the results with Vic LaSala, the company's head of R&D. So this is the, the safe side. This is the safe side, and you can see the fracture pattern, but the fracture, fracture pattern is, is only in the glass side. The defense company doesn't just protect presidents and the Pope. Its armor and shields are safeguarding the lives of law enforcement and troops on the front lines in Afghanistan and Iraq. But for all ADSI does to keep our military safe by modifying vehicles, shielding our soldiers from snipers and bombs, its most vital mission is to protect and serve history. Armin Katayan, CBS News, Hicksville, New York. Some sad news tonight. One of the most popular artists of the 20th century, painter Andrew Wyeth, died today in his sleep at his home near Philadelphia. Wyeth enjoyed a long, successful career. He was best known for his melancholy 1948 painting, Christina's World, which depicts a young woman on a grassy hill gazing at her farm home. Andrew Wyeth was 91. Before he takes the oath of office on Tuesday, Barack Obama will hear a musical piece composed just for him. Leading it will be cellist Yo-Yo Ma, who tells Michelle Miller he's thrilled to join Mr. Obama on the road to the inauguration. He's perhaps the most recognized classical musician on the planet. A cultural humanitarian whose good works have caught the ear of the next president of the United States. I have to pinch myself to actually believe that, yes, we can do it. On Tuesday, his cello will punctuate that sentiment in the moment just before Barack Obama takes the oath of office. So have you even begun so, to think about the largest audience of your life? I am so unbelievably elated. Presidents have chosen poets, sopranos, even choirs to perform at past inaugurations. But never before a classical quartet during such a critical moment in the ceremony. Along with Ma, violinist Yitzhak Perlman, clarinetist Anthony McGill, and pianist Gabriela Montero will introduce their Ode to Obama, a piece created by famed Star Wars composer John Williams. It's very hard to compose a piece that's 
short, but contains a lot, and yet we want it to be solemn and uplifting at the same time. He gave us a small sampling of the work that they'll play, and, and, air and simple and gifts. Suddenly, out of nowhere, uh, you hear mm. from the clarinet, and it's like, this is one of those magical moments. It won't be his first serenade. Ma has played for five sitting presidents. Oh, my word. We brought him to the Kennedy Presidential Library to share one of those memories. I can't believe this. Welcome, Yo-Yo Ma and Yu Cheng Ma. At the tender age of seven, he and his sister played for President John F. Kennedy. This is unbelievable, isn't it? This is like 45 years ago. Ma is both student and teacher, with a humility that can offer a lesson to even the most hopeless of cases. <laughs> nice! But nothing beats being the opening act for a man he's most anxious to meet. What will you say to him when you, when you meet him? Um, well, by that time it would be probably Congratulations, Mr. <laughs> President. <laughs> Michelle Miller, CBS News, Boston. And that's the CBS Evening News. I'm Maggie Rodriguez. Katie anchors on Monday from Washington to kick off our inauguration coverage. I'll see you there as well on The Early Show. Thanks for watching. Good night.